Thank you, Christian, for joining us today uh, with Americans for Limited Government News. Christian Watson, you are a spokesperson for Color Us United. That is a group that is new to me. Can you tell us a little bit about your group and what your goals are? Absolutely. So Color Us United is essentially a media campaign that is focused on establishing a race-blind society in America. Now, race-blind differs from colorblind because colorblind is a word that is kind of laden with a lot of negative assumptions and in a lot of contexts that a lot of folks are not in favor of. But race-blind simply means, simply beyond simply not seeing color or whatever, we don't see individuals in relation to their arbitrary characteristics. And this extends really beyond race. It extends as well to sexual orientation. It extends to any form of identity. We don't want to see people in that light. We want to see people as these unique individuals who are colorfully united by our differences. And what are you finding in this area? Are, are, are you, do you get pushback or are you well received? Tell me how the group is, is yeah. doing, basically. Well, yeah. I mean, well, there's uh, whenever you're going against the intellectual orthodoxy, there's always going to be some pushbacks. So yes, there has been some minor amounts of pushback. We have gotten comments on social media that are not so flattering, but an overwhelming majority of Americans are actually, well, at least in our instance, are actually embracing this movement. Everyone that we talk to, everyone that we we put our messages out to on our Facebook page, which has thousands of likes, people are really gravitating to a simple truth that animated the foundation of our republic. And that simple truth is that individuals individuals and our natural freedom and our natural freedom, which influ influences our natural value as human beings, that should be the cornerstone of all of our social analysis. And so when you speak this very basic axiom to people, they latch on because they've lived it their entire lives. You know, unlike these obscure academic theories like critical race theory or critical whatever theory, we don't rely on abstractions to get people right up. We rely on the truth of their lives. The American experiment is something that is so precious so special because each and every one of us has the ability to live it out in our own existence, whether it's in the frontier, whether it's in the Midwest, the blue collar workers, whether it's the white collar worker going and accruing skills and going to the corporate boardroom, all of us can live out our individual potential. And the founders knew that. That is precisely why they enshrined those delicate hollow words in the Declaration of Independence and then translated that into codification to the Bill of Rights. And that's what we stand for at Color Rush United. And Christian, in your own life, can you do you have any stories to show how this has worked for you as an African American yeah. uh, in in the United States? How has that played out in your life? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, a lot of people who look like me are 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 captured by a grievous lie that says that their individuality doesn't matter. They're part of some statistic, statistic or some part of some community or whatever. A lot of folks who look like me. Um, are, are led to believe this by people who have something to gain from them staying in this sort of mental slump. And so for my personal life, it has allowed me to number one, embrace personal responsibility, because if you don't, if you, if you don't understand that what you do in this world matters, and it's not up to some system of oppression or lack thereof for your success, then you can take responsibility for yourself. And that has animated every single step of my journey from me go, joining my, uh, joining my college as a freshman, um, to me writing on the school newspaper for a little bit, then to me starting the Pensa Politics podcast, which has by far been my most successful episode, this ethic of personal personal responsibility has put me at the front of every single exchange that I've undertaken. And now it has allowed me to be the spokesperson of a national organization. And this is just someone who came from a single mother. This is someone who, you know, did not have any sort of wealth or any sort of silver spoon. This is someone who simply came into this position through hard work. And if more black Americans follow this idea, I think there'd be a lot less stress amongst them. Thank you. I absolutely love what you're saying. And our organization, Americans for Limited Government, obviously we value a smaller government and more individual freedom, which is what you're talking about. What's the role of government in, in our lives? What, what's that proper role? I think the role of government is a very, as a role that the founders thought it was, it's it's simply to preserve our natural rights and nothing else. The government simply is there to preserve, not to give, not to take, but simply to preserve. And this comes from the foundations of the American government that is found in natural law 
theory. And even if folks don't agree with natural law theory, the founders most certainly agree with natural law theory, and they prescribe the tenets of natural law theory to be the animating purpose of government. So yes, government has no business dictating, dictating a certain subjective criteria of morals to people. They have no business trying to give people stuff. They have no business trying to push curricula down people's throats. You know, if you think about American society today, almost every single aspect of our existence is tainted by some kind of government intervention. And, and really government, if you just look at it, is force. And so if you think about it, American life is really being motivated right now by force. But force does not cause things to grow. Force causes things to stifle. Force does not cause people to come up with new and inventive techniques. Force, is, force causes people to adhere to the, the, the mood of the season. You know, and so when we when when government is pulled back, people are not under the allure of force too much anymore. Or if they are, it's in a way to protect people's rights, and they can be allowed to flourish in their own creative genius. That's the philosophy that I stand on very strongly. And you have a guest column is the Washington Examiner this week. Yes, or last week. Yes, um, that was very thought provoking. Um, it sort of turns the idea of equity and inclusion and diversity on its head. And you said that by definition, in order to have equity, there's going to be differences in outcomes. Or I, I you tell me, what's the thesis of that Absolutely. piece? I read it and I loved it. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, that was the piece that was in the examiner last week. And, and the thesis is this. If you want to have diversity, you must have an equity. Very simple. So, so the idea of equity, as posed by many people on the left, is this idea that there have been certain groups that have been historically underprivileged and marginalized, and therefore people in those groups need to have more resources, i.e. equity, um, to have an advantage over or over the groups that have been historically advantaged in their opinion. Uh, now, the, the principle of this is that it kind of attacks different outcomes. It kind of attacks the fact that everyone is going to have a different station in life, and it attributes that fact primarily to racial injustice or social injustice or whatever. Um, but if you're going to have diversity, just as a mere human principle, you're going to have people who have different outcomes. You're going to have people who have different, you know, facets of their being that may not be similar to other people. This is simply a natural fact of life. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, if you want to have any meaningful diversity, not, not alphabet diversity, but any meaningful diversity, you must have people who have differences. And if you don't, it's not diversity. That's some superficial stuff that is masquerading under the veneer of diversity, which need not be called that if we're going to adhere to the truth. So if I understand your article correctly, individuals have different strengths and weaknesses that we bring in with us. And because of that, there's going to be different interests, different outcomes, essentially based on our individual choices. And the only way you can sort of change that inequity and make and have all outcomes be the same is to stifle individual freedom. Is that is that am I seeing That's that exactly? Right? Yes, exactly. Well, well, exactly. Even that won't do it because again, life itself is, is is a matter of differences. Even in the whether it's the animal kingdom, whether it's in human society, life itself. There are so many different species, so many different people in our society, so many different interests in our society, so many different beliefs in our society. I mean, this is just the same throughout in the civil war as it is in the natural world. And so, even if you do try to use force to make people more of the same. All you're going to do is stifle the human potential and you're going to just make you're going to try to make them not live up to who they can be you're not going to really do anything meaningful and so they'll simply be living a lie so yes individuals bring different things to the table naturally as as is life as life would dictate and if you try to change that you're trying to make them in something that they're absolutely not and and these equity programs are trying to change the fact that people how are different and they, they're trying to chalk those differences up to historical injustice rather than simply understanding that folks are different and have been different since the beginning of civilization and they that this predates any sort of racial or social injustice so yes that's the point the article was trying to make and my last question for you in your article you brought in the example of the university of michigan's definition of equity and they made an analogy with a, like party. a party and yeah. tell me about that and, and why you disagree with their interpretation. I, I really like their analogy and what you did with it. 
So the idea from them is that equity, uh, equity in, a, in an analogous sense would be like you go to a party and there are certain folks who you know, don't really get a chance to pick the kind of music at the party and equity would be giving those people the chance to pick the music at the party, be the DJs. Well, now this assumes that people want to pick the music at the party. What if some folks are just at the party and they don't want to pick the music at the party? <laughs> but again, when you have this very insular, narrow-minded idea of what is good and what is bad, or what is equitable and what is not equitable, you can chalk up people's decisions to a, 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 an idea that suits your sensibilities but does not adhere to fact. Someone may just be at the party to spectate. I mean, I know I've been to parties, very few in my collegiate career, because I'm not into all that kind of stuff, but I've been to like two or three in my collegiate career, and I didn't want to be the DJ. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do any of that kind of stuff. I wanted to spectate. And so, you know, I, I just think that they don't understand that intentions really matter. And for the equity people, intentions don't matter, impacts matter. The result matters, the intention doesn't really matter because we can see what the result does. And so intentions matter and intentions can really decide why someone do, does something. That's probably a much better explanation than trying to put your predetermined viewpoint onto their actions without actually trying to explain and see why they did it in the first place. Or, it's confirmation and, and also, as I was talking to my colleague about it at a party, you have, you may have a professional DJ who is familiar yeah. with, you know, so much wide range of music that I am not. That's their yeah. job. That's their profession. They're skilled at knowing what music brings this kind of mood. And you, then you may have some party attendee who's real into heavy metal, which yeah. may not be the cup of tea for uh, very many others there. It, it could be a total, you know, mood changer that, that that brings the whole party down. So I guess the idea is, is I sort of say, leave it to the professional, like leave it to the person whose strength is that that's what they're good at. And that guy who likes heavy metal, he may be good at something else, but let him shine where he's good at. Absolutely. And you know, uh, uh, this is what I, that's why I used the, the uh, analogy of an airline. Imagine an equitable airline where anyone or, and everyone, people who have been historically disenfranchised from the airline industry were able to just come in and be the pilot. You would have so many plane crashes. I wouldn't go on a plane piloted by someone who's just, just there because they were an equity hire personally. I want to make sure that my pilot is skilled, that he is trusted, that he has a very good track record, that he has some sort of experience that is going to certify that he has any business flying jets, whatever kind of jet possible. And if he doesn't have that kind of experience, I don't care about his race, sexuality or whatever, then I want nothing to do with that pilot, him or her. So, you know, I, I, I think that, again, the idea of equity has its limits. And really, if we just recognize that merit matters and that we can, anyone can acquire merit regardless of their racial disposition or whatever, then this idea of equity becomes very moot. But if we keep thinking that differences matter more than our ability to use all differences to our own advantage and more than our ability to be unique individuals, then this equity zombie will live for a very long time and it will continue to haunt us uh, until it has gotten, it has gotten its, uh, its purpose. Christian, your message really resonates with me because I grew up in a home where I was taught um, we don't have any expectations of what you will do, but whatever you choose to do, do it to your best, like be your best and, but you figure out your own path in life, right? And I think that that's sort of at the heart of what individual freedoms are all about. We each come to this earth with the ability and, and, and talents that we can grow and, and nurture. And there's no limits on what we can do. Like the government shouldn't limit us or try to force us into a certain path in life. Um, but obviously when, when we're each given the choice of what to do, we're going to choose differently and we will all have different strengths and weaknesses. And I love that you're trying to bring that message to, to this conversation. So thank Absolutely. you. No problem. And I'm hoping I'm doing it with a, a good heap of philosophy as well, because I think that philosophy is what's missing in our modern day society. Philosophy is, I think, the answer to a lot of our problems, or at least it can provide us a, a track, a, a pathway to achieve an answer to a lot of our problems. So thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Any final thoughts from you, Christian, on this? And how can people find out more about your group or get involved and, and share your message? Absolutely. 
So Color Rush United, you can find us on colorrushunited.org, or you can find me on my YouTube channel, which is titled Christian Watson, or my podcast, which you can also find on YouTube called Pensive Politics, or on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all at Official C. Watson. That is Official, capital C, Watson. You can find me on any of those platforms, and I look forward to connecting with your audience. Again, thank you so much for having me. This has been a very enlightening conversation. Thank you, Christian. All right.